Amy Coney Barrett nomination is affecting Central New York. An app developed by SU students that promotes the Black Lives Matter movement. And a new scholarship to honor a former SU dean. All that plus weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Samantha Croston. And I'm Xavier Brown. Let's get right to our top story. Early voting began just four days ago, and the country has anticipated that over a third of the total votes have already been cast. Our reporter Ryan Clark is live at the DeWitt Town Hall to see how Onondaga County has been dealing with early voting. So it could be a week, it could be two weeks, it, could, it depends on how slow it goes. With the candidates. The reason why? A combination of voter delays and party lines. According to a new Siena College poll, when asked this question, over 80% of Republicans said they plan on voting in person on Election Day, while many more Democrats plan to either stay home or vote early. Public perception of who's ahead and who's behind in, in many ways doesn't matter until I certify that election on November 28th, you know, so. The difference in when party voters hit the polls can affect the numbers. The Board of Elections says Republican candidates like President Trump and John Katko could be leading the way heavily early. But those numbers will be misleading because not all votes will have been counted. To help the public understand, the BOE has partnered with the Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University to send students across the area to tell their stories. It's about democracy and, and action and voting. What are people's individual stories about what motivates them to vote? What was difficult? What was easy? Why do they do it? The 2020 election is less than a week away, and Syracuse residents have seen a bombardment of negative political advertising. NCC's James Corrigan reports on the damage these ads do to the political system and the one local official bucking the trend. He's got a pretty high approval rating. Higher, perhaps, than even his owner, Assemblyman Al Sterpe, who made Riley the star of his campaign last week. Watching one nasty political ad after another has made watching the news a soul-crushing experience. This ad was a response to the barrage of negative campaign ads in central New York. It's psychologically and emotionally damaging to the entire country. This year, the Syracuse TV market has seen the most congressional ads in the country. And as attack ad after attack ad plays over the air, residents have gotten sick of them. Early voters in Clay did not hold back on the ads. I'm disgusted. I'm sick of them. I think it's terrible. Turn the sound off or change the channel. The consequence of negative campaigning is more than just a few annoyed viewers. It makes that cooperation that's necessary to do politics much harder because you have disregard or deep anger toward the opposition party rather than seeing them as a potential partner. This is a reality that voters like Richard Duda are well aware of. If we're going to have actually have a better state, a better county, a better country, it's going to take positive thinking and it's going to take compromise. It's why ads like Sturpees are seen as a breath of fresh air. We've gotten dozens of emails and voicemails. They said we've been waiting for something that we can actually watch and listen to. James Cargan, Mornings on the Hill. Amy Coney Barrett has been confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States. Her appointment secures a 6-3 conservative majority for the court, enough to overturn landmark cases. Our Rob Flax explains how one case, if reversed, could impact us here in Syracuse. Rob? That's right, guys. With that 6-3 conservative majority on the Supreme Court, previously decided cases don't look so decided now. Amy Coney Barrett herself saying that the crucial case, Roe v. Wade, that decided abortion rights in this country is not settled case law and is still up for discussion. And what that means is, for instance, here in Central New York, 
are very concerned about that. We've spoken to some members here at Planned Parenthood and they say that their members are worrying that services that they rely on might not be able to continue, but for the time being, they have a message for those members who rely on the care they give. So we are still here. We are still here to provide our patients with education, with the healthcare services that they need. So they need not be um, concerned and think that they have to go out and get um, 500 packs of birth control pills today. Three, two, one, cue. Now this is an important location. This is the CNY Planned Parenthood and it would be the main location that a student would go to from SU if they needed some of these services. But Planned Parenthood says they've had people as far away as Pennsylvania come because of the quality of care that they can receive. And Syracuse students are grateful. The Panhellenic Association and the sororities here on SU have organized a fundraiser for them. Now that's independent of Barrett, but it did coincide with it. And those donations are skyrocketing, guys. They've had over 2,000 donations so far, and it's not even close to done. So a lot of gratitude from the SU community for the services Planned Parenthood provides. We'll see if those services can continue with Amy Coney Barrett on the bench. Rob Flax, Mornings on the Hill. We've been watching those COVID numbers closely as the Halloween weekend approaches. Mornings on the Hill, Syara Williams has our update this week. Syara, how are those numbers looking? Yes, that's right. And good morning, Xavier. But with those numbers looking pretty steady, there could be a change with Halloween weekend. So far, there are only 59 students in quarantine week. There are 12 active cases within central New York area, but just one outside the New York area. Now, if you take a look at this graph, you can see that the recovered cases continue to increase and there is a striking decrease in active cases so far this week. Now, given the off campus party that uh, spiked few cases just last week or a couple weeks ago, Chancellor Kent Siveruth said that there shouldn't be a gathering that hosts more than five people. Those who participate or go to a Halloween gathering can face consequences. In Syracuse, Sire Williams, Mornings on the Hill. Due to the pandemic, there's something new this year for students leaving campus for winter break. Stephen Shoemaker has more. The goal is we come back in January, but we just want to err on the side of caution first. As the end of the semester is right around the corner, Syracuse University students need to properly pack up their belongings to head home in the event that students are unable to return next semester due to the coronavirus pandemic. This time around, students will need to do a better job of properly labeling their belongings they leave behind so the housing department will know which items belong to which students. Based on what we experienced last March when it was spring break, students left, didn't pack their belongings up, and we couldn't make head nor tails of whose belongings were on the left side of the room and on the right side of the room. Syracuse students should take home all of their clothing, valuables, and essential items that they will need over winter break. Larger items like refrigerators and TVs can be left behind but must be properly labeled. Students who are living on campus will not be able to come back over the break and are going to have to return their room keys. This will be done by placing the key into the gold envelope and then returning it to your building's main office. The idea of not being able to return next semester is sad, but due to the state our country is currently in, it is safer to err on the side of caution. You know, honestly, I try not to think about it, even though like in the back of my head, I know that that's a possibility. Um, it, it makes me really sad. It is hard to accept that Syracuse University students are going to have to start to pack up their rooms in just November, but it is the right route to take with next semester being unknown. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Stephen Shoemaker. Last week on Mornings on the Hill, we told you about a scholarship being given to Kevin Richardson from the Central Park Five. This morning, we get to hear from Richardson himself to find out what this degree really means to him. People thought, not everyone, but it was others that thought that we were basically the, the bottom of the totem pole, you know, so to have my name attached to something like Syracuse, attached to kids to be inspired by me and to further kids' education. You know, at the end of the day, that's all I really wanted, to leave my imprint on the world. Um, I'm not there yet, but um, I will be taking some classes. So I'm serious about really playing the trumpet again. Everything else seems great, but to be connected, to have a bachelor in fine arts and music, that's, that's icing on the cake. 
And we are looking forward to Richardson joining us here on campus in the spring. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill. The university stepping up to honor the late Dean Lorraine Branham. Find out how. Plus, what are students planning for Halloween weekend? Stay with us for those stories and much more on Mornings on the Hill. Our resident weather girl, Sierra Ryder, is live out on the weather deck to tell us what to expect. It's been a while since we've last seen a Black Lives Matter protest here in Syracuse, but they continue. Throughout the country, reporter Sarah al Shai shares how three SU students are helping the movement in their own way. Taking all the knowledge I learned four years and actually applying it, I feel like to something the world can use. I uh, it just really just feels amazing. Caleb Obiagu, Brandon Elliott, and John Paul Bessong met at Syracuse University as computer engineer and computer science majors, and they created Safe Loot, a website mapping out Black-owned businesses across the United States. Right now, it just feels like the Black community is struggling the most. Caleb says naming the site Safe Loot is a way to reclaim the word loot, a word that's overshadowed peaceful protests. It's a way to use the word loot in a positive light, but Safe Loot does not support looting. We do not endorse looting of any kind from any business. It's just um, we also understand that the Black community, if they are looted, it would be harder to ever rebuild. With just one click, you can see all the black owned businesses throughout the United States, including right here in Syracuse. All the flavors are gonna blend and mix together. Darren Chavis is the owner of Creole Soul. The restaurant's been around for five years, but not without challenges. Once you find out it's a black owned business, they they come in inspecting instead of expecting. But Chavis says he's honored to be listed on Safe Loot. It's the support he's been looking for. This is going to give me a platform to really demonstrate, you know, well, let me know if I'm the best. <laughs> for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Sarah Alsheh. Sorority recruitment is just a few months away. Potential new members got a glimpse about how the recruitment process will run this year at the Panhellenic Greek Council's Recruitment Expo this past Monday night. Hundreds of potential new members hopped onto Zoom and learned about the recruitment process and all 13 sororities at SU. Those interested in joining a house in the Panhellenic Council have until December 11th to register. Syracuse University is establishing a new scholarship program to honor the late Dean Lorraine Branham. Our Ford Hatchet details how the scholarship adds to Branham's legacy. The Lorraine Branham Scholarship will be given to as many as 10 students each year to fund their education in honor of the late Dean Lorraine Branham. The scholarships will give talented students from disadvantaged backgrounds a chance to join other distinguished Newhouse alums, something Associate Dean Hub Brown says was always one of Branham's goals. To be a more diverse group, to be a group that was more open to the future of what the country and what, the, uh, what our professions are going to be all about. And there's just something so fitting about having a Branham scholarship pave the way for the next generation of brilliant journalists. I, I, I can't imagine uh, a more fitting tribute 
to Lorraine uh, and, and to what she stood for. But if the dean was still here, she wouldn't let the celebration last too long. Oh, I think she'd be very excited. And then she'd turn around and say, okay, so now get to work. <laughs> because she would, she'd be all about making sure we started, you know, finding those students. Branham, of course, passing away in April of 2019. But through this scholarship program, the university and the Newhouse School in particular are making sure that her melting and monumental legacy carries on. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Ford Hatcher. Xavier, Sam. Coming up after the break, Josh Miller has your orange sports update, and a World Series champion is caught partying with a team after testing positive for COVID-19 mid-game. Stay with us. Good morning, I'm Josh Miller with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. The Clemson Tigers are the number one ranked team in the country for a reason. Even on an off day, you're gonna get the best from the Tigers. The Orange, however, did hold their own for three quarters and had a lot of positives to build off of going forward. The Orange defense continued to turn heads. This defense swarms to the ball and boy, they are fast and physical. Turnovers in the Syracuse defense also go together like peanut butter and jelly. And they did that against the Tigers too. Garrett Williams, how about that man? His first career interception is a pick six against Trevor Lawrence. It was also the future first round draft pick's first career pick six thrown. Nonetheless, a crib call for Williams and the Syracuse defense is just flat out good. The Orange got it done with explosive plays also. A block punt set up a Sean Tucker rushing touchdown. Let's not forget that Tucker's a freshman and he's a beast. He's only gonna get better as time goes on and that's a great positive for the Orange. Rex Culpepper, with the exception of a few mistakes, played well, especially with the big plate of McKeem Johnson for an 83-yard touchdown. Head coach Dino Babers knew how good the Tigers were, but the effort from the Orange was there. I think you're playing a very exceptional football team and you just can't, you, know, you can't make mistakes. If you're, it's just hard to stay with a team like this. You've got to get lucky. They've got to give some to you. I mean, you've got to play almost a perfect game. And Time for the keys of the game for this weekend's matchup against Wake Forest. First, establishing a run game. Get Sean Tucker going and get the big guys up front going. Force the Wake Forest defenders to pack the box to then give space for receivers to get open one-on-one -on -one and make Rex Culpaper get some throws. Secondly, explosive plays. Big runs, big passes, and great special teams play will help the Orange next. Turnovers, when the Orange don't have the ball, take it, and when they do, keep it. It's pretty simple. Lastly, the Orange need to weather the storm. The Orange can do all these things and keep their cool through adversity. They'll be able to get back into the win column this weekend. Dave Roberts. There you have it, the LA Dodgers are the 2020 World Series champions. The Dodgers took the title four games to two against the Tampa Bay Rays. This was the Dodgers' third World Series appearance in four years, and they were finally able to walk away with a championship, their first one since 1988. Two other big stories emerged from game six of the series. Rays starting pitcher Blake Snell was taken out of the game after not giving up a single run, and the Rays up one. I guess manager, Rays, manager Kevin Cash thought Snell was pitching too well. Next at bat, Mookie Betts gets a double, sending Austin Barnes to third, who would then come home on a wild pitch, tying the game. Then at the start of the eighth inning, Dodgers third baseman Justin Turner was removed from the field after his COVID test came back positive. After the Dodgers win, Turner was celebrating back on the field with teammates at times without a mask. The Dodgers didn't directly address Turner's behavior, but the move was highly criticized on social media. Regardless, the Dodgers are your 2020 World Series champs. Now for a look ahead to this weekend for Cuse Athletics. Women's soccer takes on Miami on Thursday, still chasing their first win of the season, currently sitting at 0-3. Cross country competes at the ACC Championships in North Carolina Friday. And at 8 p.m., men's soccer is in Virginia, also looking for their first win, coming off a tie against Virginia Tech last Sunday. Saturday, we have football against Wake Forest. And on Sunday at noon, women's soccer has another go against Virginia. Still to come here on Mornings on the Hill, we find out how restaurants are going to fare a Syracuse winter. Stay with us. That story and more just ahead. Onondaga County has put $200,000 aside to help local restaurants stay afloat this winter. Earlier this week, I went to a local restaurant to find out what one restaurant owner plans to do with the money. In March alone, Restaurants lost $25 billion and 3 million jobs nationally. Rise and Shine owner Danielle Mercury says the $5,000 grants will stop the bleeding. 
I think we have about 700 restaurants in Onondaga County. I mean, think about every single one of them going to 50% capacity and then, and then half of them going out of business. That's a lot of money that's just gone. The grant is aimed at helping restaurants extend their outdoor dining season. Mercury has already spent thousands on an outdoor patio, four heaters, and a fire pit. But even with all of that, on days like today, when the temperature drops into the 40s, people choose not to eat outside. That's why Mercury plans to build a see-through dome-like structure right here in the parking lot that will be fully heated. The structure should be done by the end of November and will fit 25 to 30 people. One in three New Yorkers in the restaurant business are still unemployed since the beginning of the pandemic. New York State Restaurant Association President Melissa Flyshoot says that getting employment numbers back up in the industry is crucial for community and economic development. When restaurants go into a neighborhood, they tend to work really hard to revitalize the community and bring people together. They provide jobs and then you see oftentimes that other businesses will come back. Mercury says adapting to change is what makes her and the people in the restaurant industry so resilient. We have that backbone that just kind of pushes us to keep going no matter what. So when we faced all these challenges, it was just one more day for us. Applications for the grant will be available on the Economic Development website by the end of this week. Finally this morning, the CDC released guidelines on how to stay safe when celebrating Halloween. Some of the activities they suggest to avoid may surprise you. Door to door and trunk or treating violate social distancing, costume, masks, don't substitute face masks, and the two should not be layered. It is a safety hazard because layering masks makes it hard to breathe. While wow, betting, make sure hands are clean. Outdoor movies with other friends is dangerous if screaming will likely occur. More distance is needed to lower the risk. There are lower risk activities that you should try instead. One is social distance pumpkin carving. Another is scaven scavenger hunts in the neighborhood while admiring houses. It is even safer to do a scavenger hunt in your own house. Movie night is also a great option, especially if you can do it in your own home. There are plenty of Halloween themed movies to pick from. In virtual costume contest, make sure to have a prize ready for the winner. Speaking of prizes, Xavier, one great one could be chocolate. It is National Chocolate Day and I for one am ready to celebrate. What's your favorite chocolate if you had to choose one? This might not be a popular opinion, but I am not a chocolate fan. What would you say your favorite piece of chocolate is? For me, definitely Snickers or Milky Way. But folks, either way, whether you like chocolate or not, make sure you find a way to celebrate today. Well, honestly, that is going to do it for us this Wednesday here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Xavier Brown. Follow us on social media. And I'm Samantha Crosson. Thanks for watching, Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday live at 10 a.m. right here on RTN.